Thank you all for coming. This is the, uh, the Tech Forum, an opportunity for internal external speakers to come and present our technical topic uh, of, of their choosing. Today we have Lee Atkinson, who's a Principal Solutions Architect, Chaffee, yep, uh, from AWS. He's going to be talking about how uh, AWS can apply AI to the world of media. So, Lee, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so we're going to talk about Amazon AI uh, applying the different services, different technology that we have as, as Amazon Web Services to media and entertainment. Uh, just to introduce myself, if it progresses. First technical hitch, there we go. So, yeah, just to explain, my name's Lee Axon, I'm a solutions architect. Uh, I work in the media and entertainment team within the uh, UK and Ireland. So that's working with <coughs> customers such as uh, broadcasters like yourselves, uh, but also uh, publishing, newspapers, anything to do with media and entertainment, including gaming as well. Uh, my main focus is around broadcast. Uh, that's not necessarily just broadcast the technology, it's broadcast the customers, so I get to meet uh, a range of different uh, opportunities and projects that broadcast customers are working on, so not necessarily just focused on just uh, broadcast video uh, type scenarios. Um, I've been with uh, AWS for about uh, just over five years, uh, hence it goes orange when, you, when you've been with uh, Amazon for five years. Uh, previous to Amazon, I used to work for smaller companies uh, primarily in broadcast media, uh, media uh, providers, so working with broadcasters, uh, online video, I did many different webcasting from live events and uh, also doing a lot of uh, webcasting of parliament and a lot of government uh, institutions as well. Uh, I have a background uh, in development, uh, quite a limited background, it was really to get a job working, get something working for the company I was working for, rather than being a, a, a you know a, a full-time developer. Uh, you probably noticed that there isn't anything on there about uh, artificial intelligence. I would not purport to be an expert in artificial intelligence. Whilst I was doing this, I did actually remember that I did actually do it at my final year of university, but that's like last <laughs> century, so it's probably not that up to date. Running on a on a four eight six machine, uh, so it sh shows how much uh, compute power I was using at that time. So we'll start off talking about. Artificial intelligence in Amazon as a whole. So the key thing of thing about Amazon uh, is 22 years old. AI was um, used in Amazon very early on. So it's not as though as AWS we've created an AI service specifically for AWS customers with no background and no knowledge. Amazon itself uses uh, a lot of artificial intelligence across a lot of its services. There's thousands of employees within Amazon working on artificial intelligence. Whether that's, and it's quite common, the idea is discovery and search, recommendations, that's quite obvious. But also other things like logistics, being able to plan uh, stock control and where the stock should be across the many different fulfillment centers across the globe. Um, logistics, so uh, I don't know if you've seen, there's a video, uh, Amazon has a robotics division. So you have robotics that are moving stock around fulfillment centers. That's all managed by artificial intelligence. So to plan the quickest route between different locations and working out what's the best route for those uh, robotics. Enhancing uh, existing uh, products, so things like uh, Kindle, uh, the Kindle Fire tablets. Uh, also, obviously, uh, fairly obvious that it uses artificial intelligence are Amazon Alexa. So you see that within uh, the Echo product range using artificial intelligence to understand what the person's asking, define what should be produced, and developing artificial intelligence for a response. And then the next bit is where AWS fits in. So AWS is bringing artificial intelligence that we've developed within Amazon to our customers. Whether that's data scientists really understand machine learning, can go deep, deep into the, into the topic, or for people who are perhaps developers and they they need to achieve a goal, but they don't necessarily know, understand artificial intelligence. So our aim is to reach all those different types of customers. And it's just an example. I don't know if anybody has. Uh, this is an Echo Show. It's a product that was launched, I think it was in October in the UK. It's an Echo device, but it's got a screen. And this is showing an example of using uh, Alexa um, Talk, I think it's called, or Voice. Basically, the, the ability to do video calls to your, your friends, but the key thing was this, you're able to use, using artificial intelligence, just your voice, to do the dialing and the answering of that message. You don't have to touch the screen at all or touch any buttons. 
So another example is Amazon Go. So this is in uh, Amazon headquarters in Seattle. Uh, it's a shop where there's no cashiers, no tills, no self-service checkouts. Uh, you walk in, you have to have the, the app. Uh, you walk in and you can just take things off the, off the shelf, all the different products and you just walk out of the shop. There's no scanning or anything like that. There's no checking in. You just, it's using artificial intelligence to detect who, you know, what products you're taking off the shelf and accounting that. And it's within a few seconds, once you've walked out the door, it will then give you uh, effectively the till receipt, what you've actually uh, purchased at that point. Um, I did go into this earlier this year. Unfortunately, because I, I'm not a UK customer, I don't get access to the app, but I was with a colleague who took me around and went in there, and it's, it's really odd that you go in there, you pick up something and you walk out, and you feel like you're going to have a you know, store detective come chasing after you. Uh, but no, it worked really well, and it's quite amazing. <coughs> if you, see, you probably can't see the picture, but there's lots and lots of cameras just looking all the way around, and it's detecting what's been taken off the shelf and then put back again, all using artificial intelligence to understand what's going on. Another example is IMDB, which is an Amazon product. Uh, using artificial intelligence to understand uh, what the pictures are, what the video is from various different uh, films and movies, TVs, and then providing this uh, metadata uh, as part of what's called X-ray. So during the playing of the video, you can stop it. It will show you the uh, actors that are appearing in that scene and then a biography with them. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, what they all mean. Well, essentially, it's all about detecting whether it's a dog or a muffin, <laughs> which is actually quite hard to do. I mean, if you do dog or muffins, there's also dog or towels, pretty hard. And then finally, there's dog or fried chicken. And you certainly don't <laughs> want to get those wrong way around. Um, but if you think about those three different things, that essentially, they mean the same thing. They are slightly different. If you think about it as a timeline, artificial intelligence as a concept started to happen in the 1950s. Obviously, we didn't have the compute power to actually deliver artificial intelligence. And actually, as you study it more, you realize actually it's a harder problem to solve. But essentially, artificial intelligence is the, you can think of the, you know, the grandfather of all of these. It, it, it comes to the idea of using computers to effectively achieve something that you would normally expect an intelligence to do. Machine learning started in the 1980s. Uh, you can think of machine learning as just really advanced statistics. Basically, what it's based on is using statistics to determine an outcome after you've trained a model. So you have the input, you, get, you have the desired output, and then once you've trained that model, you can then test it and use new input data and see what the output is predicted. And then deep learning. So a 10,000-foot intro to deep learning. So this is using... Often, I guess it, deep learning used to be called neural networks. I guess neural networks sounds a little bit old and a little bit 20th century. So effectively, deep learning is just is effectively neural networks. So it's using neurons, or sometimes get called perceptrons. So it's trying to simulate how a brain works. Effectively, it's the connections between these neurons and the weighting of those connections. When a signal is fired across these neurons, they pass on signals onto other neurons and so on, so on, so on, until you get an output. So as this example, you've got neurons going through different layers. And this is an example where it's taking, you know, trying to identify a face. So you're actually feeding the raw data of the image uh, into, the, uh, into the neural network. As it passes through the layers, it's detecting certain features, so quite basic features, so yeah, edges, that sort of thing. And then starting to understand part of those edges, what do they uh, uh, combine with? So things like detecting eyes and noses and understanding those sort of things. And because it understands or well, it's learnt that eyes and nose in certain positions should be a face, it can then detect a face. Part of the training model is to go over these many times, and the more layers you've got, the more neurons you've got, it obviously gets more complicated. You have to try lots and lots of different weightings and, and, and linking between the two, between the layers and neurons, before you get a model that can actually predict and understand the input. So think about AI on AWS. Um, some of the key things is doing things in real time. It's quite hard, it's quite computer intensive to do uh, deep learning or artificial intelligence. So using the cloud gives you that flexibility. The, one of the key things is often you need something to train the model, you need a lot of compute power, but you don't need that all the time. The actual uh, detection, the in inference, 
doesn't use necessarily as much compute power. So you actually need the compute pod power to train the model, but you only probably need it only for a few minutes, a few hours, depending on how complicated the model is. So the ability in the cloud to spin that up, to do the training and then close it all down, uh, saves a lot of money and a lot, obviously a lot of expense. You'd have to procure the hardware to actually do that. Having access to uh, GPU, so uh, graphics processing unit, typically used for generating video, because they do a lot of floating point arithmetic, that makes them really useful for doing things such as deep learning. And in fact, there are specific types of GPUs which are only used for doing that sort of arithmetic rather than a general producing video. They focus just on the arithmetic. Obviously, CPUs is obviously a classic. We understand what CPUs are. Another one is uh, field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs. So this is the ability to actually almost program your, your compute to provide. So rather than just writing software for that, you're actually changing and setting up the instruction set effectively of your own compute to run these uh, simulations, these models, very effectively. We launched FPGA's uh, machines, I think it was the end of last year, so it's about a year it's been available. And then also the ability to mix between doing training locally or training in the cloud and then doing the inference, so using that model to either run locally on smaller devices, because they tend to use less uh, compute power, or running them in the cloud if you've got a large model. Another thing is also at the bottom there is uh, we launched per second billing only a few weeks ago on EC2, which allows you to run these models for a very short time, run less than an hour, and only pay uh, for what you use per second. So if you're building a, a, a deep learning pipeline in the cloud, there's quite a lot of things to build. So if you look in the middle bit, to actually do deep learning, uh, you do need humans involved, because obviously you can't just show a picture or many pictures to a, a, a computer and it will understand whether it's a dog or whether it's uh, fried chicken or whatever. You have to have a human basically providing that answer built to, so that you've got that output, that result that you're looking for to be able to train that model. Often you use a data scientist who will actually work out how to do, develop the model so you get the correct model with the correct accuracies. And often this training goes around and around a circle, so you'll do it over and over again and you'll develop and improve the model over time. It's not like a thing that you just do once, you're, you're building and re, uh, rebuilding that model, quite often versioning that model off so you can go back if there's a problem and change this sort of thing. Um, and there's a lot of other things, obviously you've got the customer actually getting the, you know, putting the input, uh, running the, uh, uh, the analysis and getting an output. And across AWS, there's many different services you can use. So, if you've got to upload a lot of images, so if you're talking, say, millions of images, use AWS Snowball to upload uh, potentially terabytes of data into AWS. Obviously, store the dot, uh, data in S3. Uh, you can use a, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, so this is when you want, uh, and it's, defi it's actually defined as artificial, artificial intelligence. So you're actually using humans to run, to do simple tasks, but you can use that to train the model so that your artificial intelligence model can then perform those tasks. Uh, Lambda is used across a lot of this pipeline, so effectively gluing the logic together of the separate pieces. Also using uh, S3 and Glacier for storing those archives. Uh, and then EC2, S, uh, ECS batch for, for doing the compute, training the model. And also API gateway. So that's where you can build a deep learning pipeline, but there's quite a lot of things to build. So, the other approach is to look at the Amazon AI stack. And if you think, start at the bottom, that, that slide previously is along there. So we've, we're giving you all the building blocks, the infrastructure blocks to build the deep learning pipeline that you want to build. However, there's a lot of, you need to understand deep learning really well to build that because you're going to be doing a lot of, uh, a lot of the deep learning uh, technologies around it. So as you move up the stack, we're, you're moving more and more to a, a managed service that we provide for you to to perform a particular type of task. Obviously, you don't, you, you, have, you don't need so much knowledge and experience of deep learning, but perhaps if you, don't, if you want to have that you know, superior control over it, you perhaps may stay lower down the stack, but it's up to you. I, I would advise that you always start at the top and work down, rather than starting at the bottom and work up. It's a lot easier to use the top services, see if they perform the task you want to do, and if not, then you can move down. So we've looked at our services that we offer. Across, these are the ones across the top. 
So the managed service we offer is Amazon Machine Learning, uh, Amazon Poly, which is the turning the text into speech, Amazon Recognition, so recognizing images, and Amazon Lex, which is the conversational engine. So it will, it will be able to turn um, uh, speech into text and understand the commands and drive a chatbot. On the far right hand side, which is DIY, we provide an AMI, uh, the machine, uh, deep learning AMI. So this is an AMI, which I'll show in a bit, but it's an AMI which has got many of the common libraries and tools that are used for machine learning, deep learning on an AMI that you can spin up. And, uh, and along the bottom, there's many different partners that are using either our services or they're building on top of our services to offer services uh, to, to their customers as well. So the AMI that we offer, the deep learning AMI, this is uh, an AMI that's available, it's, it's free, it doesn't cost, it's, it's, and it's got the uh, common tools that are used. Uh, there's many different types of tools for deep learning and people have preferences, so we provide an AMI with all of them. We have uh, the drivers for NVIDIA, drivers uh, optimized for this AMI, so it's a one-click launch, you can launch that and run that and do your own modeling and testing. So on the bit of the bottom, the EC2, in, uh, EC2, we have, I guess, four different types of uh, EC2 instance types that are used uh, for deep learning. Uh, probably the most common ones, we have the P3 instance types. So this is running an NVIDIA V100s. Uh, they have a petaflop of uh, compute power. So this is one of those general purpose GPU. So it's a GPU that's optimized not for generating video, it's optimized for doing many calculations. The G3s are the GPU, standard GPU video ones, but they're also very common as well for uh, deep, lean, deep learning projects. F1s are our FPGA instance types, so these are where you can program your code into the FPGA. Uh, as well as, obviously we have AMIs for launching virtual machines in EC2. There's also um, uh, images that you can launch with, uh, FP for FPGA uh, instances, so it allows you to use effectively a marketplace of FPGA instances. You don't have to write it all from scratch. Uh, so you can launch those from, from partner solutions as well. And at the bottom, the X1. So these are the ones with very large amount of uh, uh, RAM. Uh, so, they're, uh, so they're RAM intensive. Uh, I think we now have the X1Es or the XE1s, I'm not sure which one, which have up to, uh, I think, four terabytes of uh, RAM as well. Here's a, uh, an example. Uh, Clemson University in the US, they ran, they had, I think it's just over half a million uh, documents, academic documents, and they ran uh, on uh, EC2 uh, to analyze those documents and to understand the, the topics that are being described in each topic, in, in each document. Uh, they used 1.1 million uh, vCPUs, and I think at the time that was uh, a world record for launching those. Uh, they launched them only in one, easy, uh, in one AWS region. There was enough capacity for them to launch that. It ran for three hours and they shut it all off. And they were able to analyze all these documents to understand what, each uh, what the topic is and effectively summarize what the document is, is talking about. And obviously, this is quite specialized. It's academic documents. Um, but you can see these as quite a good use case in media. For instance, let's say if you ha you've had all the documents from, say, the Paradise Papers, uh, to be able to go through all those paradise papers and actually uh, understand those documents. Rather than having to, uh, humans go through every single page by page, I think the paradise papers were done by uh, an element of crowdfunding, or at least they spread it across different news organisations. You could use uh, deep learning to actually run across those documents and look for information of, of particular interest. So Amazon Sh Machine Learning is one of our services that we launched uh, a couple of years ago. So this. This sits in between uh, having deep machine learning, learning experience and being a developer. So you need to understand some of the concepts of machine learning, but you don't need to necessarily have to get your hands dirty and into the weeds to actually build a, a model. It's a, it's a managed service to allow you to build a model for machine learning uh, and, then, and then use that to do predictions. Uh, so there's three parts to doing machine learning. First, you've got to build that model. So you're taking data where you've got input, you've got output that's already been created. So whether that's by humans uh, detecting the output, or maybe it's data from previous previous uh, uh, previous projects you've collected this data. 
you, you do need the input and the output. Uh, build the model, uh, then you validate and optimize and see how that model uh, performs against test data, and then you can use it to make predictions. So when you build the model, um, you, what will happen is the mach Amazon machine learning will split the, the data that you provide. It will use part of, the, part of the data for building it, and then part of the data for, tr uh, sorry, part of the builder, part of the data for training your model, and then part of the data for testing it. The key thing is you, you shouldn't test with the same data you train, because then you're, you're going to get false results. So it splits that. You then train the model, or it will train the model. And then it provides you with the output of how well the model performs. And you've got some um, configuration here. So quite often it's a trade-off between fault positives and faults negatives. You've got to do a bit of a trade-off. So it allows you to do that trade-off, build up that model. Uh, and then once you've trained that model and you've tested and optimized it, the next thing is to do the prediction. So there's two types of predictions. One is batch prediction. So you can actually provide it with a batch of uh, input data and it will calculate and give you the, out the predicted outputs. Or you can do real-time prediction. So if you think about if you've got um, fraud detection, for instance, you probably need to d determine whether this person is a, a risk of fraud or not. So you would use real-time predictions in that example. So you can actually d determine whether they're a, a fraud risk before you uh, ship the products, for instance. So Amazon Poly. So this is a service that takes text and turns it into a uh, lifelike speak, speech. It uh, supports many different languages uh, and also accents as well. And it allows you to build very lifelike speech. So you can put intonation and things like that. It understands uh, uh, things like phone numbers, how phone numbers. So it doesn't say zero and all this. It will actually say, oh, whatever. Uh, and it makes it very natural, uh, natural sounding. Once it's generated uh, that's, that audio, it's an audio file, you can then reuse it. So you don't necessarily have to use uh, Poly to create the same text each time. You can use it to generate clips of audio that you can reuse and, and build into your application. So some examples for uh, media and entertainment. You can think about building a, a, a fan interaction with, a, with the app using Poly so it can talk to you. Uh, you can turn text into speech, so things like listen to the news, so you can have uh, your app read the news to the listener rather than them having to read it. Um, generates uh, characters in, in uh, TV programs, so actual TV uh, characters that could actually talk. Uh, and also things like executive assistance, so building uh, uh, an, uh, an assistant. For Amazon Lex, you can sometimes think, and you probably if you notice, Lex is the three letters inside Alexa. So we sometimes talk about it, Lex is the Lex in Alexa. Uh, so this is building a, a conversational chatbot. So again, um, this allows you to build, it can be either voice or text, but it allows you to build a text so you have a conversation. So if you, if, how many people have got echoes? A few of us. So although you, don't, you, you can have some conversations, they're usually quite short short to get to what you want to achieve but often you can ask Alexa to, to do something and that will it will respond with another question which you can then interact with so if you think for Lex you could build a lot much a lot longer uh, chats you can be very interactive and going backwards and forwards between the service and yourself so some of the options again a building interaction with with chatbots for, for fans building uh, just interactive different types of things for different use cases, whether they're media entertainment or whether they're just general uh, industry type use cases. The next one is Amazon Recognition. So this is a, a vision managed service. It supports different types of use cases, so objects and scene detection, facial analysis and comparison, recognizing faces, so against uh, a, a, an index that you've built up, uh, celebrity recognition, and image moderation. So, object and scene detection. The difference between an object and a scene is it's detecting an object chair, but it also detects that the scene is a living room and it's indoors. So, as well as individual objects, it will detect the overall view uh, as part of the scene. So, this is detecting these. What it will always do, although it doesn't show on this, um, this slide, it's always a, um, 
how how certain is it? It's, there's a percentage of certainty that it would say. So uh, I don't know exact figures, but it would probably say things like the chair would be you know 92% uh, short certain. It's not totally obviously we can see that the chair. We're not absolutely sure. It's an odd angle of a chair. So it will give you a, a percentage of probability. And as part of your application, you can determine what level of probability you would like to see to be certain of that object or scene. Uh, facial analysis. So recognition will be able to detect faces in a picture. Uh, we recently increased the number of faces it, it can predict uh, within within a single uh, image. It will look. It will identify uh, bounding boxes around faces, a position of eyes, etc. But as well as that, it's looking at certain things like uh, sentiment. So it will determine whether that person is smiling or happy or confused. Uh, it will determine or it will guess at, say, for instance, the, the sex of the person. Uh, and it will also uh, determine uh, their age as well, or an age range. Face comparison is looking at similarities of faces. Now, you can see here, this is, we could probably guess that, that is the same person. But they are quite different pictures. You know, it's got a beard on the left-hand side. It looks a little bit old on the left-hand side. His hair, hairstyle is quite different. And also the angle of the face is different. So it doesn't need to be a, a face fully looking at the camera. It can be from a certain angle to be able to make these uh, predictions. Facial recognition. So this is where you can build up an index of uh, a database of, of images and be able to compare and identify that particular face uh, in that database against uh, the, the picture that you provide. Uh, one of the things is that these pictures aren't stored in recognition. It will store just the, the vector information, effectively the, the data that is built up from the model in, in recognition as a service. And then another one is uh, celebrity recognition. And no, I don't know who David Ortiz is. I'm not sure if anybody knows who he is. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it will detect uh, yeah, celebrities. So the celebrities are built up over, over many different uh, data sources. IMDB is one, so it's got a very good uh, uh, for, for movies, movie stars and, and TV program stars. But I've also tested against uh, yeah, Premier League footballers and, and more UK-centric celebrities, and it will, it will detect those as well. And also for image moderation. So being able to see if anything's explicit, anything suggestive, uh, and it'll be able to flag that. So if you imagine you've got uh, user-generated content you're uploading, you can actually run this to see if there's anything like that to, you know, to make sure you don't publish those images. And then uh, just this week, we launched uh, a new feature, which is find text in images. So if you present it with an image with text in it, it will detect where those, uh, where those texts are, and they'll put a, a bounding box around each of the individual text words. So it's a way of uh, extracting uh, textual information out of the image. And recognition itself integrates with all the um, other AWS services. So obviously, uh, things like storage in S3, it can access content out of S3, uh, but also taking data out of uh, video files, individual frames, and do recognition analysis on those. Um, also, just hooking it into different services so you've got this pipeline. And as well as the AWS services, we've also got partners and third-party software that are building on recognition and pro <coughs> providing and implementing it within, say, asset management to, do, to extract metadata out of those images. So what are the use cases for recognition? So extracting metadata, so extracting pictures of objects, whether the, vi whether the audio, sorry, whether the video and whether the images themselves <coughs> Uh, are shot outside or buildings or shows a car, whatever. Um, be able to do things like sentiment tracking. So you have an audience, you could actually um, take pictures of them and see whether they're enjoying uh, the presentation, the video, the TV program. Uh, adding dynamic data, so similar to X-ray for the uh, Amazon with IMDB, adding metadata, display metadata on screen. And then also for moderating that content and making sure that it's uh, suitable for uh, audiences. So here's an example. Uh, this is the video, uh, sorry, is it image. Uh, it will detect uh, the scenes such that uh, there are people in that, uh, there are bricks in the background, and it looks like a playground. I guess it's probably more of a back garden. It has got uh, a lilo there. Um, 
but they also detect the people, so it's pulling out information about the people. Uh, you can see the, the, the confidence level, so, um, so it's sort of pretty confident that she's smiling. I think she's probably <laughs> looking into the sun, therefore. But it will do things, you know, it doesn't have a beard, which is pretty accurate there. <laughs> Uh, and then it can you know, detect people, but then it can actually do things across. If you do this against video, you can then obviously detect when those people appear in a video stream and then be able to show, show where they are and be able to jump to that sort of thing. So you build it. Uh, can you do that live? The like, video? Yeah, or does it have to kind of be a recorded thing that you can do um, it? So, it, so recognition needs still images. It needs a, an image. Right. So, you so you could do it live, but you've got to be sending it. Uh, Another, th another feature that it launched was, uh, and it, it describes it as real-time image recognition uh, or facial recognition. So that's an improvement, uh, and, and that's quite a key thing for using for, say, for security, being able to recognize someone appearing. Um, uh, and also, there's, it's used as an example for human trafficking, so looking for pictures of people and social media and be able to recognize whether they are uh, a victim of uh, human trafficking as well. So this shows you an example. So effectively, you've got the, the data going into S3. Uh, using the um, S3 events can fire off a Lambda function that can start uh, the process against Amazon recognition. Uh, once the data has come back, it can then send it into uh, a media asset management with the extra metadata that it's found, put it into Elasticsearch, and then allow you to search for tags information, you know, looking for ch children that are smiling into the sun. That sort of thing. Uh, other examples is, let's say if you've got video content. Now, quite often you can have video content which is, it's been, it's been transcoded in different formats. Maybe it's been cropped. Maybe it's been color corrected. It's quite hard. It's easy for humans often to be able to say these two videos are of the same thing. But it's quite hard. You can't do simple, um, you know, not checking the file names or checking for, uh, simple, doing simple hashes against the actual uh, files themselves. So it's quite an easy task for humans, quite laborious, but with using deep learning you can be able to provide it with two different video files and be able to determine whether these are the same video, video content itself. Another example is for doing uh, anti-piracy tracking. So let's say if you've got uh, pre-release uh, movie uh, being released for people to review, uh, to make, uh, you know, get feedback from. It's quite hard to track if they get leaked, to track where they came from. So again, you can uh, embed uh, watermarks, etc., into the different video content and then use deep learning to analyze and determine the source of that particular video file. Where did it come from? Who had it? Uh, who, who was given that video file? Another example um, is to think about not just using uh, touch as a user interface, and actually think about using voice. So using Lex and Polly to interact with uh, systems. Using your voice is the most natural way to interact, is to use voice, rather than having to use uh, your, your, your touch. And quite often, you may be using your hands to do something else, perform some other tasks. So if you want to perform a secondary task, perhaps in a, in a you know, television studio type scenario, you could use your voice to uh, command the system. Another example here is um, using sentiment analysis. So let's say if you've got a, a live studio audience, uh, you're filming them, well, sorry, you're filming them the, the program that they're watching, but you could also have a cameras on them. And then you could actually understand their sentiment, whether they're enjoying the, the not just from the clapping, but actually see what they're, how they're uh, reacting uh, facially to, to the TV program that's been uh, filmed. So again, uh, Use, yes, the cameras are collecting that information, using uh, uh, applications to feed it off to recognition, to recognise their sentiment, and then feeding it all back to generate reports. And as, a, as an example, this is showing um, the change of their sentiment over, over time. C-SPAN in the US, so C-SPAN covers uh, a lot of the government, you know, Congress uh, sittings, uh, with, with Congress people. Uh, they built, uh, when we launched recognition, within three weeks they'd built a service that uh, took in 99,000 users and able to index the video and understand both live and on demand who that person is speaking. 
So this was a great time saver. So rather than having to have humans identifying who the speaker is and, and entering the metadata, they were able to use recognition to do that. And here's um, an example of their architecture. So they, on the right-hand side, um, on-premises, they're encoding the video streams that they're doing normally. But from there, they're actually extracting a single image, single frame. I think they're doing it every six seconds. And that's reason because the content of the C-SPAN is not really changing. It's often a lot of people, you know, it's one person speaking for a long, long time. So they're grabbing the image just at once every six seconds, uploading into S3, uh, which fires off an SQS trigger. They're actually using EC2, but you could probably use Lambda at this point, but they're using EC2 uh, to analyze that. What they're doing first, as I said, that the, the person might uh, be speaking for you know, many, many minutes. And so the actual, between these six seconds, the frame may not actually change. It may still be the same person. So they're actually running some code locally on the machine that's just doing a very simple check to see, has this frame changed much from the previous frame? And that's really just to save a bit of time. There's no point sending the same frame almost to recognition. There is a cost uh, involved, so they're checking to see if the frames are significantly different. Sending into recognition, which has built up, uh, it's already got that index of all those uh, uh, speakers, and then be able to recognize and, and provide who the current speaker is. So some of the key things we need to think about doing deep learning in the cloud. Actually running the infrastructure is hard, especially when you've got a model that's changing over time. It's very hard to do it and change your model and, and to, but never go down, uh, uh, I should say go down, but never, often when you, change, when you train a model and you replace a model, effectively the service gets interrupted. So things like recognition, the model is being trained all the time and, and, and improving all the time, but you never, you never have any interruptions to the service. You need a lot of faces, so one million faces to be able to recognize uh, reliably different people. So there's quite a lot of storage involved as well as the actual compute power to do this. So that's why it's beneficial to do that in a managed service. One other service I want to talk about is Amazon Macy. It may not necessarily be obvious for media and entertainment. So Amazon Macy is a, is a machine learning security service. This has the ability to uh, inspect your content in S3 and look for potentially um, uh, you know, personal identifiable information and looking for you know the potential risks of leaking data. So not only will it examine and look for data such as um, you know, AWS API keys, uh, SSH keys, uh, it will look for certain uh, credit card numbers, etc. And it's not just doing it in a simple regular expression, it's actually understanding via deep learning. We'll also look for any unusual changes in, in the way that the data is being accessed and being used. So if it suddenly sees that something's changed, suddenly there's a lot of data being scanned, for instance. It can alert that there's something that's going on that's not normal. Obviously, it will baseline, a ba uh, baseline against what, how you normally interact with it, and then it learns from that, and then it will alert if it changes from that baseline. So this just shows you, uh, it, uh, looking at the um, content in, in S3, it doesn't actually highlight on this one any specific to media, but you can see this, it's pulling out certain things like um, hacker keywords, financial keywords, Cisco router configuration, uh, passwords, this sort of thing. So it's detecting things that look like passwords. It may be absolutely fine, but it's detecting those and then you can take action on those. So, if you've been to a, a, an AWS media and entertainment uh, presentation, you've probably seen this. Uh, these are um, workflows that we've identified across, really from ingestion to taking live video or, or uh, uh, file-based content in, uh, editing, uh, video effects, dam and archive, uh, media supply chains are producing, uh, readying that content for distribution, delivering that content, whether it's play out uh, for broadcast or OTT, publishing the content and uh, analytics. Often people think about machine learning as being really in the, um, the analytics part. So being able to understand, know your customer, understand what they want to watch and uh, make recommendations. But it's, it's important to think about the whole workflow. Is, uh, the, there's candidates for machine learning all the way along. So from optimizing your content, understanding uh, w what content people like, and be able to make sure, make recommendations, 
in the actual uh, content generation part. So not just recommending a particular program to you, but actually recommending what kind of content the commissioners should be commissioning. Uh, extracting metadata, uh, but also optimizing the delivery of content. So you can build the optimization and understanding in the actual content delivery as well. And what we find, you, you get this flywheel that if you provide better recommendations to users, better content to users, uh, more users will con uh, consume more content, which generates the better data that you can then feed back in, uh, back into the system to make better uh, content uh, suggestions and, and, and uh, what's the word? Uh, decisions, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, make better decisions on the content that you create. So, demo time, which I always love because it probably won't work, but there we go. <laughs> um, <coughs> so if I come out of this. So, this is the um, recognition uh, console. You can see down the left-hand side here, these are all the different uh, services that recognition, recognition provides. So, um, if I start, there's an example here. I'll just use this one as an example first. But this is, uh, so it's detecting things such as skateboard. There's a human there, there's people. So quite often these tags are very similar. So obviously human, people, person, they're very similar. Uh, but it's detecting lots of different tags and giving a, um, how confident it is that it's detected those uh, images. There's another one here. So here it's detecting, you see, building, city, downtown. They're very similar. Again, very similar tags, and we would probably use them interchangeably, but there was, there was always a slight difference between the two. So um, to be aware that there's not always just one tag that you would think that's it. Um, if I go to facial analysis, and I have uh, my photo. So it's found my face. It's quite an easy because obviously it's the full-on face, but uh, um, the age range is, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I appear to me male. And I'm not wearing glasses. Um, but we can also do celebrity recognition. Uh, and so if I go to desktop, where is it? Keeping the ITZ thing. And so, so that's recognised the, the actors from um, Cold Feet. These learn more. Uh, often they usually, most of the time they're for actors and things, there'll be links uh, through to the IMDB page as well. So a lot of the training's been done from the content that's in, these, uh, in this website. Um, the one other thing I've got, because I really wanted to test it, as I'm a celebrity, and to be honest, I wouldn't guess any of the celebrities on that. It's probably sacrilege to say that to ITV. Yeah. Uh, now, interestingly, so I did recognise her name, Shappy Kosandi, but I didn't recognise anybody else. This one, I think that's um, Boris Johnson's father. That's not him. So it has actually, um, there's only 57 confidence that it's this person, whoever Bob Uka is, it's, it's wrong. So he does get it wrong, I'm just showing, but it. Yeah. it you know, a few things is those images, those pictures are very small. They're not like full pictures. They're very small. So even to base on those people. And in fact, um, if I find it, you can tell which is Ant and which is Deck. <laughs> one's on the left, one's on the right, isn't it? <laughs> um, so it does detect like Dennis Wise, for instance. So if Dennis Wise was in that picture. I think you know it was a bit unfair because the pictures, are, the face is quite small, but it does actually detect him in that shot. Uh, I guess if, it, if, you, if you do it for a video, then if in a particular frame it can recognise the person than 100%, then... So, so recognition, yeah. you have to feed it with frames, so it's not necessarily... Um, it can't use a series of frames to make any more better predictions. It's just looking at that frame in its entirety. So um, it's a product suggestion. <laughs> yeah. So that's, so that's a better picture of... of and I, I didn't actually check if that is the person, but... Sorry? Oh, is it? 
Well, actually, at that point, because I do know Ian Lee, but I did not recognise him as a, his picture, so I think I was pushing it. <laughs> um, and I think that's correct for her. So obviously, that's a better picture. It's, it's a bigger picture of her, although it's still pretty small. You can see what it actually was looking at. It's quite a small, quite soft picture anyway. One other thing uh, is text. This one here, uh, so this is just a screenshot of I found on Google of ITV News, and it's pulled out the text uh, that it's found. So you can think about using this that you can actually detect uh, text in a, in a live video to actually um, maybe to confirm things, maybe spot typos, uh, that sort of thing. So all these are examples. They're all in the in the demo, so you can test these uh, direct in the console. Obviously, as you know, most AWS services, it's still it's available through the API SDKs, etc. So that was demo time. Just a bit of a summary. So. Um, <laughs> The key thing is to think about using those managed services. So although you've got all this power to build your own deep learning uh, solution, you will spend quite a lot of time on that because it's compute, uh, it's human intensive to build that. Um, so think about using the managed, managed services first uh, uh, for doing things. So there's nothing to stop you building recognition for image recognition. And then perhaps you've got something quite unique that you need to do image recognition on. Maybe it doesn't do it. Well, then you can fall back and use the, the deep learning AMI and build your own model for, for doing that image recognition. Uh, other things is to think about modeling. You can model in the cloud or you can model locally. Obviously, there's a, there's a problem with that because of compute. But also think about doing in, inference. So I know that there are, if I remember, so MXNet is a, is a popular deep learning uh, uh, library uh, project. Uh, Amazon, uh, as Amazon, we, we like it a lot. We, that's not to say we, we only only like that one. We like all of them. And uh, MXNet has the ability to run locally on, on phones as well for the actual inference. So you can build and train the model in the cloud, which is very compute intensive, and then run it locally. Think about using different types of compute, uh, especially using spots. So the ability to bid for compute power um, saves a lot of money when you're training a model. It's not the end of the world if, if a instance, uh, because of the spot price uh, peaks, uh, you lose that instance. The fact that you're training, you can start again and save a lot of money than running on demand. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, so I, I guess it's uh, it's like an arms race, isn't it? So uh, yeah. we're going to be tested more and more to see whether we're humans. Yeah, Get yeah, to the point where we won't be able to answer the questions. Um, um, I, in theory, yes, you could use you can use deep learning to detect and try and get around those bots. So that's something to be aware of. Um, there's nothing. Obviously, we can't stop it. Yeah. Um, but it is. I guess it's a it's an interesting um, puzzle. Yeah, I was <laughs> Uh, I'm not aware of discussion, but it, it makes perfect sense that that, that is going to be a um, it's going to be harder with, as compute power gets stronger yeah. to be able to do those things and prove that you're a human and not a deep learning engine. Yeah. There's another. You, you mentioned uh, text to speech, <coughs> but not the other way around. Do you do the other way around? Yes. Yeah, so um, Lex does speech to text, right. so you can. Um, now the uh, Lex is, is, is because it's a chatbot. It's not designed for say you can't run a, a continuous stream of, of, of speech and it will turn that into text. It's very much a understanding commands and short lived. Now we've there is an example that's actually done basically be able to create um, speech to text uh, continuously, so you can feed an audio file, audio stream in, but that's 
not what it's intended for. It's intended for you know, short sentence or two. But it allows you to basically to turn the speech to text, but then also, obviously, if you, if you notice with uh, Alexa, you don't have to say, you know, provide the command in exactly the words that are, you must do. You've got flexibility and say it in different ways. And part of the Alexa thing is to train so it understands how you would ask for a particular thing. Uh, Lex gives you the ability to give that flexibility so that you can use different types of words and different synonyms and different structures uh, to understand what the actual question you're asking or the command you're giving. Can you uh, recommend some, like, getting started resources for uh, business? Uh, good question. Um, I need to check that. I don't... The biggest issue is, I guess, it is that sort of quite a high barrier to entry technically. So, and, and I think the, the big difference is that up until we provided um, F1s, um, it, it was very expensive for you to get, you know, buy your own FPGA to do that. So there's always been that barrier to entry because of that. I think it's, I don't want to use the word democratise, but the fact is it's easier because you can spin them up and use them. Um, it's easier. Um, they'll probably, if you look at the AWS Compute blog, there were probably if you, and search for FPGA. There may be some examples about how to get started. Uh, I think there's a few, as well as deep learning, it gets used to things like doing um, encoding video as well. So there's uh, party, uh, partners that have built the software to do um, HEVC encoding, uh, like 4K encoding on, on them as well. They are uh, Xilinx uh, based boards, so they're just standard. I'm not exactly sure the model number, but it's a standard. We, d we do tell you what the model number is, so you can probably read up, sp uh, you know, particularly for that board. Obviously, you've said everything is image-based at the moment, but do you have plans and roadmap plans for video? Um, so there is a lot of people ask about the video. So at the moment, the, the solution that we have is to you know, to grab those frames, which uh, with the improvements that we made for, you know, for instance, the, the, the real-time uh, facial recognition, it means you can, you probably won't really grab a frame every... Every, every single frame, but you can still uh, grab a frame every few frames. Um, one of the things, the FPGA has got the ability to do recognition at about, I think, like 2,000 2, frames per second. So it is possible to grab those frames out of video and recognise each frame. Uh, but at the moment, recognition is just purely still image-based. Any other questions? Um, I would I would say if, so I would say that things like makeup is probably fine. Yes, if you've got you know, prosthetics and you know if you're made up you know like a sci-fi uh, alien, it would be struggling. Uh, but, but most of them, uh, most things like pretty simple makeup and you know wearing a hat, wearing a gla wearing glasses, different hairstyle, it, it, it will recognise. Obviously, it reduces the confidence, um, but. The face has to be changed a great deal to not recognise. If you're a blue alien, it might be hard. Did you say that all these things are available then? Yeah. All, yeah, all the services available, yeah. Mm -hmm. How does the facial recognition software work with I So I would... I, yeah, I think it would it would recognise. Yeah, prob most probably would recognise if they're identical twins. It most probably would recognise the same per as the same person. I would say. I haven't actually tried that. I should try that. Thank you. Lee. Okay. into that and it's absolutely fascinating. I think the thing that kind of really struck me is what I could do for historical video and photos. If you actually went through the past hundred years worth of wartime photos and actually maybe do facial recognition to actually kind of join people up that maybe had never been kind of put in. So the other one I was thinking, you messing with there because I speak at conferences like you do, and actually some real time analytics in front of you to see if you're boring everyone or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or a joke, <laughs> okay, that's great, thank you much. And the team found them happily boarding some lovely swag in the corner, so make sure you get some of that in the way out and a donut. Um, talking about playing with these things, we do actually have an AWS Playground account. 
and uh, if you promise not to spin up any X instances, of uh, my, uh, my, my financial director will tell me off, then I can give you, or we can give you an account. So if you're interested in that, talk to your friend, <coughs> neighborhood platform engineer, and they'll be happy to set one up for you. And I know Lee and the team are going to be hanging around in the area just out the back here um, for the rest of the afternoon, and then coming to the tech social later on as well. So if you want to chat AI, machine learning, uh, come along and uh, have a drink uh, with us. So that's great. Thank you all very much. Cheers. Thanks.